What's up, Duval? It is your favorite former Jaguar, Bucky Brooks, and this is Believe in Jaguars, podcast dedicated to all things Jaguars. And we're really excited about today's show. We have a couple things that we're going to cover. We're going to talk about the three key offensive players that will really determine whether the Jaguars go from good to great this season. And we also will begin to talk about the schedule release. At the time that we're taping the podcast, the NFL hasn't fully released the schedule, but they have dropped some snippets that involve the Jacksonville Jaguars that are really exciting. So let's get right to it. The Jaguars are a big part of the international series uh, this year. The Jaguars will play two games overseas, just like they did last year, two games in London. And it's a huge opportunity for the Jaguars to not only expand their fan base, but to kind of take advantage of knowing the lay of the land really well overseas over in in London Uh, because the Jaguars have done it for over the past decade. They kind of understand how to prepare, how to get ready to play those games. They've been fairly successful in those games. And last year they swept the competition in back-to-back weeks. Well, it was so good that the Jaguars signed up for it again this year. So this year on October 13th, uh, the Jaguars will go on the road and play the Chicago Bears in a game at Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. Um, it'll be an opportunity for the Jaguars to it will, it will be an opportunity for the Jaguars to see the number one overall pick, Caleb Williams, to see a revamped offensive roster that includes Keenan Allen. Uh, we think about Roma Dunze joining an offensive lineup that already featured DJ Moore, one of the best. Uh, wide receiver cores that you can find. So the defense will be tested uh, Look pretty early in the season by a good Chicago Bears team. The Jaguars would then stay over in London and they will host a home game against the New England Patriots at Wembley Stadium. This is a chance to see Drake May, the third overall pick in the draft. We'll see uh, Jared Mayo take over. This would be a different version of the Patriots than we've seen with Bill Belichick. But look, it's another big game Nonetheless, a a game against an AFC team, a game to really help you uh, potentially in the playoff race when you think about the tiebreakers and such. But more importantly, this is an opportunity to win back-to-back weeks against rookie quarterbacks, potentially, if Drake May is the starter. And to really jumpstart the season, not quite at the midway point, but at a time where you want to begin to start making a run. Last year, the Jaguars were able to knock off the Atlanta Falcons and the Buffalo Bills respectively um, at the time really kind of jump-started the team and helped them get to a point where they were eight and three looking like they were going to maybe wrap up the AFC's top seed. Didn't go that way, but this year gives them an opportunity to do it. And what I can tell you from watching uh, the team last year in a similar situation, uh, the advantages that the Jaguars have by playing overseas is they certainly are able to get their their bodies on like the right clock uh, because you're over there for two weeks. You kind of get to settle down. It's not as big of an issue for the Jaguars as it will be for some teams trying to adjust to the time change and uh, how that can affect your body clock, your practice time and those things. Because the Jaguars have been overseas so much in terms of playing these games, um, they kind of understand how to get the cadence and the rhythm of the practice schedule to put the team in the best situation to play really, really well on that Sunday. Some teams who have, are unfamiliar with playing overseas, they're still trying to figure out the schedule. When do they go over? Do they go over on a Thursday? Do they take the whole week? All of those things. So for me, I think this is a huge advantage. It's an advantage that the Jaguars have, I mean, a competitive advantage that, that really should help them in what will be a very, very competitive AFC. So you have Jaguars playing two games internationally in October, October 13th and 20th. Both games are in London. One week, they'll be the road team. The next week, they'll be the home team. But for the Jaguars, whenever they play overseas, it's really a home game. Huge advantage for them. So we look forward to seeing the Jaguars kind of dominate that two-week stretch to see if they can distance themselves from the opponents in the AFC South. Now, today, we really want to talk about uh, something that's really, really critical to the Jaguars season, and that is which offensive players are going to step up and help this team get over the hump. Last year was disappointing by any stretch of the imagination. Team finished nine and eight. And even though it was the identical record as the year before, didn't make the postseason tournament, really gave away a bunch of games at the end of the year and found themselves on the outside looking in. Uh, 
the fallout from that has been a lot of changes in the offseason. Defensive staff goes out, a couple changes on the offensive staff, but really personnel being swapped in and out. Um, and so that, that kind of brings me to the three key players. And look, it, it, it's not a coincidence, but it's going to be a theme. The Jaguars would go as far as this offensive line would carry them. A lot of the attention would be on Trevor Lawrence. Some of the attention would be on the skilled players and what does the uh, first round pick, um, Brian Thomas Jr., how does he perform as a rookie? But really, the season will be uh, made or broken on how the offensive line performs. Uh, this offensive line really struggled last year. Uh, we talk about a team that was near the bottom of the pack in, in several categories that are directly related to the offensive line. But let's talk about them. So last year, the Jaguars on the offensive line, 25 point, 26.5% of their offensive runs went for zero or negative yardage. That, I mean, look, that that is that is awful when you think about what it does, when you're unable to run the ball. So just think about this. On 120 rushing attempts, the Jaguars either got zero yards or negative yards. What that does is it puts you in long yardage situations on second and third down. Let's tie that in. Last year, the Jaguars had the most long yard situation, the second most long yard situations of any team in the National Football League. The only team to have more with the Cleveland Browns, who had third and nine or more, more than the Jaguars. And so when you think about 178 times the Jaguars are either in second or third and nine plus, it's hard. It's hard to win games. It's, it's just hard to win games when you're not in those favorable situations. And it really ties into what can you do as a play caller if you're unable to move the ball successfully on early downs yeah you can call and drop all these plays but when the defense knows that you have to pass it just makes it very very difficult to move the ball effectively on offense so i would say the number one key player that we have to watch on offense is cam robinson cam robinson like many of us did not expect cam robinson to return to this team last year um people thought with the salary cap, he would have to be a casualty because of the cap number and those things. The cap jumped up significantly, and it really created a path and an opportunity for Cam Robinson to come back. Cam Robinson last year missed eight games. Four of those games were due to a suspension. Another four were due to injury. And I, look, I'll be honest with you, watching it from field level, this offensive line struggled without Cam Robinson on the field. What Cam Robinson brings um, as an experienced player, as a veteran player, uh, he gives this team toughness. He brings some physicality. And really, when you look at this team operate, this unit operate together, he brings leadership. Cam Robinson's leadership is definitely felt on the line of scrimmage. When you sit, particularly where I'm at, behind the bench and just kind of watch the interactions, it's clear and apparent he is the leader of that offensive line. He welcomes the smoke. He likes mixing it up. He doesn't mind engaging. And, and some of the nastiness and grittiness that you need your offensive lineman to engage in when you're trying to have an edgy team. Cam Robinson brings the edge. And without him, this team lacked that. It lacked the edge. And it was kind of, you know, musical chairs at the line of scrimmage. Walker Little kind of bouncing in and out and doing some of those things. You had Anton Harrison on the right side. So that created opportunities for Walker Little. But I'll say this. Walker Little is not the player that Cam Robinson is. There may have been that expectation that Walker Little would be that player, but right now he's not that player. Cam Robinson is really important because as the left tackle, not only on the blind side of the quarterback when it comes to Trevor Lawrence, making sure that he is upright and protected, that you don't give those free rushes and free runners to the quarterback that eventually lead to turnovers, but you have someone there who has the potential to be an upper echelon offensive tackle in this league. Athletically, physically, Cam Robinson has all of those things, he just has to be on the field, be available, and play at that level. Because of that, his presence is very important to what the Jaguars want to do at the line of scrimmage. If this is going to be a team that runs the ball more effectively, keep in mind, there will never be a run-heavy team. This won't be yesteryear when they used to run the ball with Fred T and MJD and, and really try and pound it. This is a team that would like to operate in that 60-40 round, 60 pass, 40% run, uh, run when they – uh, need to run the clock out, run it in opportune moments. But this is a team that wants to throw the ball because they believe that Trevor Lawrence is the best offensive player. They want to give him every opportunity. Well, the only way that Trevor Lawrence is going to get those opportunities, one, you got to protect him. 
And two, you have to be able to run the ball to keep the defense from teeing off on the Jaguars' uh, aerial attack. Cam Robinson is critical that as the blindside protector, he has to win his battles on the edges against the premier pass rushers. And look, not only a division that is becoming increasingly more competitive when you think about the Colts drafting Liatu Latu, uh, Daniil Hunter teaming with Will Anderson, uh, being a producer, Harold Landry being a player that is one that you have to worry about with the Tennessee Titans. Well, Cam Robinson needs to be able to step up and own that. But he's not alone in terms of stepping up. And sometimes it's unusual to put uh, pressure on a free agent who wasn't necessarily a big name free agent, but I would say he might be the most essential free agent to come on board, meaning Mitch Morse, uh, veteran player from the Buffalo Bills. He is a key player in this mix, and I have him as the second player that needs to perform and play at a high level for this offense to go from good to great and for this team to realize some of their dreams. Mitch Morse comes over from the Buffalo Bills, nine-year veteran, a guy who has 126 career starts under his belt, a guy who is, look, well-respected in locker rooms around the league. When you talk to the people up in Buffalo, they just talk about his leadership ability, the the poise and, and, and the calm that he brings to the huddle when you have a young quarterback like a Josh Allen, the way that he was able to control everything at the line of scrimmage, not only from a physical standpoint, but mentally making sure that the front line was on the same page. When you think about the offensive line, uh, the center is the brains of the outfit. He is the brains of the outfit because he makes all the calls at the line of scrimmage. He directs the protections. He talks about, hey, do we need to change this run game? He handles a lot of the stuff to make the game easy for the quarterback. Last year, Josh Allen with Mitch Morse on the center, fewest sacks that he's ever taken. He only took 24 sacks last year. Uh, you think about a guy who had a win rate uh, in pass blocking at 94.6%. Those are huge numbers and a significant upgrade over what has been playing there, Luke Fortner. So even though this is a competition and they were talking about it being a competition during training camp and those things, you would like to think that the expectation is that Mitch Morse is going to win the job from Luke Fortner. Mitch Morse is going to be the guy who kind of solidifies the offensive line. And if the offensive line is solidified, it should perform better. We talked about the lack of production on the ground, the negative plays, the tackle for losses, the things that put them in long yard situations. Well, what also happens when the offensive line doesn't perform well, you have a lot of turnovers. Last year, the Jaguars finished with an, a minus three in the turnover differential. Um, that's at the middle of the pack. But for a team that started off the season playing really, really well, at one point after six games, they were plus seven in the turnover margin. They fall apart. So just think about that that deficit to finish at minus 10. That's uh, minus 10 over the last, what, 11 games that puts you in a, a negative situation. And when you really dig down deep and you look at how this team performed down the stretch, uh, there were three games where they had four turnovers you, uh, down the stretch. You just can't have that many turnovers and expect to win. So Mitch Morse and the combination of Cam Robinson, those two veterans being able to kind of dominate their respective position, that gives them a chance. And we would look at the offensive line as it could be and probably will be constructed. Cam Robinson on the left. Ezra Cleveland, who was re-signed after really being a nice find for the team in the middle of the season. He'll occupy left guard. We assume that Mitch Morris will be the center. Uh, Brendan Sheriff at right guard. And then Anton Harrison at right tackle. Um, if we have to talk about the potential weak link of the line, that'll probably be Brandon Sheriff. But you take that because you talk about a guy who's a, a, a former All-Pro, a, pro, a perennial pro bowler, who is uh, still capable of playing really solid football. Even if he is in the twilight of his career, even if he is battling through injuries and those things, um, to have him viewed as the weak link, man, I think you sign up and you take that. Now it's about all five of these guys up front playing together. Last year, we didn't see the quintet really play together. The projected starting offensive line rarely had opportunities to play together and practice together. If this 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 quintet, the, the, the front line, if they can – stay healthy, stay available, get all the reps that you need to get in training camp in the early part of the season, this offensive line should be pretty good. I know this is what Doug Peterson and Trent Baalke are banking on. They're banking that this offensive line plays better, and that is going to unlock the potential of the weapons on the outside. Well, that brings me to the third player who has to play really well, and that's going to be Brian Thomas Jr. And it's hard to put a lot of expectations on a rookie to come right from the collegiate game to the pro game and have a lot of success. 
but he has to do it. And the reason why he has to do it is because his presence on the field is really important, not only to what Trevor Lawrence does, but it's important to the other pieces around him on the perimeter. When we think about this offense, this offense really played dink and dunk football uh, for most of last year. They couldn't push the ball down the field successfully. They weren't efficient or effective with the deep ball. And so that allowed defenses to squeeze and collapse on the passing game. It really, really closed and tightened some of those windows that were available to Trevor Lawrence in 2022. And Trevor Lawrence couldn't generate those big plays because everything was tighter. Well, now in the offseason, you made a concerted effort to bring the deep ball back. Uh, You go and sign Gabe Davis from the Buffalo Bills, someone who has 27 career touchdowns, someone who averages like 16 yards per catch. You have to respect his ability to make big plays down the field. Well, now on the other side, you put Brian Thomas Jr., a guy who led college football with 17 touchdowns. Uh, Of those 17 touchdowns, 12 of them were 20 yards or more. Just just think about this, what I'm going to tell you. Last year, the Jaguars, their team combined were just seven touchdowns of 20 or more yards. And that's air yards, just throwing it 20 or more yards. They only had seven as a unit. Last year in college football, this guy had 12. So when you think about the big play factor, he is going to be a a, a significant part of that. The other um, thing that you see is the Jaguars have gotten bigger on the perimeter. When you bring Brian Thomas Jr. in, a guy who is 6'3", 210 pounds, he runs sub 4'4", you now have a bigger body on the outside. That big body not only allows him to win 50-50 balls, but it expands the strike zone for Trevor Lawrence. When you go back and you do a deep dive at Trevor Lawrence and when Trevor Lawrence has played at his best, let's go back to his college years. Well, in college, who was Trevor Lawrence throwing to? He had T. Higgins on the outside. T. Higgins, 6'4", basketball standout in high school. In two years when they were together, he had 25 touchdowns. And I'm not saying that Brian Thomas Jr. is – T. Higgins, but there are a lot of similar traits when it comes to their physical attributes, size, uh, vertical jump, length, all of those things. Being able to win the 50-50 balls down the field, well, now you're giving Trevor Lawrence a bigger target. Last year, the only big wide receiver that he could throw to was Elijah Cooks, who didn't really get on the field enough to make an impact. Now you're talking about um, a player who is a proven big play specialist, a guy who did it at a high level at LSU, a guy who is still just scratching the surface on what he could be as a player, you now bring him into the mix. You put him opposite Gabe Davis. You have Christian Kirk in the middle, Evan Ingram on the inside. You have Travis Etienne in the backfield. You force defenses to kind of pick their poison if he is able to make an impact right away because some of the double teams that would go to Christian Kirk and Evan Ingram, you now have to drop those and you have to keep a safety back and you have to pay close attention to Brian Thomas Jr. and his ability to take the top off the defense. And with Gabe Davis on the other side, another potential big play threat, it will change what the Jaguars face on a weekly basis in terms of coverage. That loosen coverage will not only help Trevor find more success uh, throwing it, but it'll loosen up the box for Travis Etienne. Uh, Travis Etienne, who's had, look, solid production, back-to-back 1,000-yard years, but didn't have the big plays last year that he had the previous year. Some of that is because there are more defenders in the way. Some of that is due to the leaky offensive line that didn't play well at the point of attack. But when you start moving those bodies out the box, the numbers now favor the offensive line. It favors the running game being able to get on track. And that favors more, that leads to more one-on-one opportunities on the outside, which leads to more big play chances for Trevor Lawrence. So when I look at this group and I think about Brian Thomas coming over and what he can do down in the red zone where the Jaguars struggle at a 50% touchdown clip. This makes this offense potentially more efficient, more effective, more dangerous and dynamic. And when you think about Brian Thomas Jr. being one of the key players along with Mitch Morse and Cam Robinson, I think you have the basis covered in terms of why this offense should be better. If these three guys play at a high level, Cam Robinson and Mitch Morris, they solidify the front line. They add physicality, toughness. They give this team an identity at the point of attack. You talk about veteran leadership, which will make this team tougher because those guys would demand it from their peers. All of those things come come into play. And then with Brian Thomas Jr. being the big play weapon that can continue to open up this field, there are a lot of reasons to be optimistic about a team that was 9-8 and and it's kind of been kind of cast aside as a team that can compete as a playoff team. But if these three guys play at that level, oh, the Jacksonville Jaguars would be um, 
legitimate contenders not only go to the postseason, but they have a chance to make a deeper postseason run because these three guys made major contributions. So there you have it. There you have a little bit of my thoughts on this offense and how this offense can go from good to great. These players performing at a high level, Trevor Lawrence playing at the level that we expect, uh, particularly if he signs the blockbuster contract that most of us anticipate over the summer. Doug Peterson being more comfortable because they're able to win the early downs and whether he's the play caller or the play call suggester, it allows him to have um, a a better opportunity to kind of dictate the terms and play the kind of style that they want to play, where it's a high octane offense complemented by a takeaway prone defense. Uh, take away obsessed defense rather than prone. Um, that is the formula. That is the recipe for success for the Jaguars in the Doug Peterson era and continues to be that if they're able to play well on that. Uh, so that's the podcast for the day. We have scheduled release later uh, on Wednesday, Wednesday night. I think it's uh, eight o'clock Eastern. We will talk about all things that are really uh, that are uncovered when we find out the slate. We'll talk about it on Friday's podcast. We'll talk about how it looks. What are the potential pitfalls? What are the key areas on the stretch of the season where the Jaguars really have to uh, make their mark, where they have to pick it up? Who are the tough games? And what is the tough stretch that they really have to navigate to get to it? But until then, make sure you subscribe, rate, review uh, the podcast wherever you're listening to it. Make sure you tune in to Believe Network on FUBU to catch all of the shows. Look at the Believe uh, channel on YouTube. Subscribe, click on that. Let's continue to build up this community as we continue to bring you great stuff. So until next time, I'm Bucky Brooks for Believe in Jaguars. I'll talk to you soon.